Hey, good morning, everybody. Carl Blackstone with the Chamber. Glad to see y'all uh, in this abbreviated format of uh, for our issues forum. Apologize uh, on a couple of fronts. One, you're stuck with me today. Our, our uh, Macon could, Loveless could not be here today um, as our chair of our, our public policy committee. So he sends his regrets. And secondly, we're on Zoom, uh, our least favorite format but it does uh, help us stay healthy. And uh, so we apologize for the late notice that we had to move to Zoom, but uh, it, it's uh, probably for the best. So want to welcome everyone here, and especially our two uh, prominent guests, uh, Mr. Todd Rutherford and Mr. Micah Kasky, members of the South Carolina House of Representatives. Um, I was gonna let them introduce themselves, but they do such a boring job. Uh, so I thought I would do it. Um, and just Todd, Everybody knows Todd. Todd's been serving since 1999. I'd say something, but we're the same age, and so it would not be good. So never mind. Uh, Todd, it serves on ethics committee and ways and means. Um, he's had numerous roles throughout his career, but uh, I would say this. He's not only a, a practicing attorney, but he's got several other businesses as well. So he recognizes the, uh, the pains of small business ownership. And uh, but he represents part of downtown uh, Columbia. So delighted you're with us today on Dramamine. And uh, then we have Micah Kasky. Uh, Micah represents the, the great nation of Springdale area of, of Lexington uh, County. He's been serving since uh, 17, I think, 2017, you got elected. Uh, but, but he also has a, a, a standout career, not only as a Marine, uh, but also solicitor's office before uh, taking office here and as, as practicing attorney as well. So thrilled y'all are here. Got a lot to cover uh, in a short amount of time. So we're going to get at it. But uh, welcome and appreciate y'all taking the, the morning to be with us on Zoom. But, uh, but just for housekeeping, there's a Q&A section. So if anybody's got questions for either Todd or Micah, shoot them in the Q&A section and we'll get to them. But uh, right now, uh, I've got a couple of stock questions for you, and then uh, we'll, we'll let uh, we'll turn it over to some of our participants. Um, all right, we've got just an awesome year coming up. Uh, we've got earthquakes happening. We're in the second year of a pandemic, and we've got billions to spend. Finishing redrawing election uh, lines for elections, and then we have elections for the House and for the uh, constitutional officers. Am I missing something fun? No, I think you hit everything. Yeah, yeah that's pretty much it. So that's going to be the the gamut for the for the next six months, right? That looks like it, and and I hope that the Senate is going to pass out medical marijuana as one of the first bills, so at least we'll be able to self medicate and feel better about our lives going through this pandemic. <laughs> Hopefully, at least. Uh, well, I tell you, I, Todd, you, you have seen this. And I, I totally, I, I just mentioned from the House side, what I didn't mention was the Senate is going through somewhat of a historic shift with the passing of, of Senator Leatherman. So we literally, I, I, maybe this has remnants of, of 2001 when the, the Senate switched hands to Republicans. Do you think it is that big of a deal? I think it's even bigger than that, because back then you still had the same people in charge. They just switched parties. But this will be a sea change because Harvey is so different uh, from the way that Leatherman operates. And it'll be interesting to see what his ethos is going to be, how he's going to maneuver, uh, who he's going to hold grudges against and where he puts his priorities. The House has 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 had our game in line for a number of years now when Merle took over the chair of Ways and Means. The House is truly clicking on all cylinders when it comes to the budget. The Senate was doing the same. It'll just be interesting to see how Harvey picks up the baton and runs with it. Yeah, what you think, Micah? Even though you weren't around in 2001, but for those that are new to Columbia or not paid attention, 2001 was when the Republicans took over the Senate, and that that was the sea change. Uh, it was uh, Vern Smith switched parties. Republicans had the votes, and so they they took out the seniority system and went through a purge, if you will, and went to a, a party system hybrid, if you will. But uh, it was a unique year. So, what, what you think? Similar things, Micah? 
Uh, yeah, and I should I should disclaim any uh, responsibility for anything I say because my clairvoyance on political matters is, is virtually non-existent. But uh, <laughs> since I get a chance to talk, I'm happy to do it. Um, yeah, I, I think the real question for this session will be what what does the Senate do? What does the Senate look like? Um, I think you can expect the House to do uh, what it's done in the past, which is have a, a, a very solid budgeting process. Uh, as Todd said, uh, Chairman Merle Smith has is, is led that uh, in exemplary fashion, and um, it shows. Uh, and then we'll do some virtue signaling. I think we'll say to the people, hey, here's some things, here's some ideas, and we heard you. Uh, but whether or not those become law um, or, uh, well, I guess, whether it's good law is a whole separate question, but whether it becomes law or not will be a, a function of, of how the Senate operates. So I think, uh, if anything, I'm as curious as anybody to see what uh, what it looks like. Yeah, I agree. Well, since you dug into a couple of issues, let's talk about some of them. I mean, literally, we, we the pandemic is one. Uh, we're, we're certainly at a the spike of all spikes that we've had uh, currently. But with that, the, the trickle down impact has been 18 months of, of this since we shut down and, and we're coming in from a budgetary standpoint, the federal dollars that have rolled into the state are unbelievable, right? Uh, Todd, when I started, when you started, the budget was total, South Carolina state budget was about four, three and a half, four billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And this year alone, you're gonna have $3 billion to spend in one time money. That's right. Uh, all federal, different pots. Um, is that gonna be a monumental fight or do you think there's some agreement within the house on, on priorities? I think it's going to be both. I think you're going to have a fight behind the scenes, but I think at the end of the day, we're going to come together and figure out exactly where the money should go. But as you talked about, the lead off is going to be the pandemic and where this Omicron has taken us. I don't think anybody saw us where we are right now. I don't think we, we anticipated lines around the corner for testing, running out of the, the at-home test in any drugstore in South Carolina. Nobody anticipated that. And this Omicron appears to be so contagious that people are just getting it, sitting around, talking to one another, whether it's outside or inside, so much that everybody has it. And so we're going to have to deal with that first off, because we've got a room with 400 people in it at some times when you got lobbyists and members and everybody standing out there, that it's going to be a problem for us to get together the way we were doing it last year. And I don't know how you move forward talking about spending that kind of money when you are having a hard time getting people in rooms. You certainly can't do it by Zoom call. So that's gonna be the interesting part of it. But then secondarily, South Carolina has simply done a great job of budgeting. We, we had our own reserves, even without the federal money coming in. Uh, so anybody that's listening needs to understand that we are doing okay. In fact, we're doing better than okay, as long as this pandemic doesn't drag us back down. So we've got federal money, we've got state money, and most of our priorities have already been budgeted. So we're going to have money to spend to go to areas that hopefully will move us forward, that allow us to grab the baton and start running down the field with it. And I just hope that that's where we do it. And that's where we put the money. Now, the problem is, again, those priorities raise their ugly head and you've got to deal with them. And you just don't know right now at the beginning of session what exactly they're going to be. And I'll just keep talking because it's a Zoom call and so it's hard to shut me up. But uh, the reporters have called me and said, what are our priorities going to be? And it's really hard to figure out because until you start session, until you get everybody in that room, until you hear somebody throw out an idea and know that that's something we're gonna have to deal with, right now, I just don't know exactly what they're gonna be. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Michael. Um, yeah, I, I have to agree with everything that, that Todd said. I mean, certainly the, the practicality of, of meeting together um, with a lot of people who like to talk and like to talk loudly uh, in the confined space. And not just, and, and this is important, particularly with respect to the budget process, is most of the budgeting work is done over in the block building in subcommittee and then to some extent full committee. Uh, and then of course in uh, smoke filled back rooms, which are all smaller spaces. And so how do you do that safely is, is certainly a question uh, that I know the, <clears throat> the speaker's office is, is working on. Um, and and uh, I, I'm optimistic we'll get, we'll get a, a good product going. Um, but, and as Todd says, um, when we talk about budgeting, there's, there's people who bring ideas to the table and then there's uh people like me who ask a lot of questions uh you know when you start talking about well let's we're going to spend billions of dollars in one-time money you know the thing that always come to comes to my mind is 
what, what's our ongoing responsibility in, in terms of, of maintenance and upkeep and operation and uh, what, what sort of future obligations are we incurring when we just spend that money? Um, because very little things you, you, you spend money on, you build it, and you can just let it be with no maintenance costs. And uh, deferred maintenance is, is something that we haven't fully shrugged off uh, in terms of our responsibilities. I, I'm not eager to, to uh, force that on ourselves again uh, readily. Well, speaking of which, I mean, the governor came out with a proposal earlier this uh, well, late summer, early fall, with proposing spending 370 some odd million, I guess, on uh, widening 95 and 26, which I can't find one human being that travels the roads would not support increasing on, on interstates. But, um, but we've got a ton of federal dollars coming for infrastructure. But with that comes the caveat of a $200 million price tag, the matching fund for the state. Do you, are y'all on board with, with up in 200 million a year for five years for DOT? Yes, yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. And we cannot at this point spend enough of that money preparing for the future. Right now, I don't care what highway you go down in South Carolina. I was going from 77, up 77 to Charlotte the other day and ran into the type of traffic that you used to only run into on 26. And if that's where our future is, we've got to prepare for it right now. You know, we've talked about the stories day in and day out of leaving South Carolina and going to Georgia on I-95 and how it opens up like the promised land. And you've got four lanes in each direction that South Carolina is constrained to those two lanes. Christy Hall came forward with a proposal, said, give us this $376 million or whatever it was. We can start widening 26 to make it four lanes or three lanes, I'm sorry, all the way from Columbia to Charleston. We've got to do it. We've got to start expanding our infrastructure. If you consider the fact that 85% of the jobs at the port of Charleston are outside of Charleston, you know that those containers have to get there somehow. And that's a lot of trucks on the road. That's a lot of containers. If you look at the backup in containers coming into the country, once those containers get here, they've got to move from Charleston to the upstate. They've got to get on our highways and we have to prepare for that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not opposed to uh, widening our interstates. I mean, as you say rightly, uh, Carl, like nobody is opposed to that. The question, though, was a matter of, of, of practical reality. There are not road construction companies who are like, man, if we could only find the work. Oh, geez, I've got this asphalt company and nobody will pay me to do anything. We've got two problems. We've got a shortage of, of, of contractors who can do the work. And we also have a problem with project management within uh, state government. I mean, our ability to manage projects in a timely fashion is, is lacking. And I'll say it because there's a larger audience. It's lacking. And if you need an example of that, try and go from downtown Columbia out to rural Lexington County on I-20. You know, that project was delayed by 10 months or extended by 10 months because of poor quality control, quality assurance in the management process. So before we just dump another... 200, 300, 400 million dollars in this. Let, you know, let's make sure that we have done uh, the backside work to, to ensure that we can handle that because uh, we've got to not only fix our roads, but we've got to do it in a way that doesn't make the construction effort take, you know, a decade or more. And, and not just to pick on malfunction junction rebuild that, you know, right now, best case scenario, that takes seven years. But there are other projects around the state that. Dear God, it, it is not that hard. I mean, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just trying to pave a road. And you've already got the uh, right of way acquisition completed. So what are we doing? Anyway, third right, cup. Listen, uh, <laughs> when you see these YouTube clips of people building bridges overnight in Europe, in Europe and in, uh, in Asia, it's amazing. They spend 24 hours, they can fix a bridge. It takes us years. I mean, we're downtown Columbia. We're about to close down uh, Blossom Street uh, for two years. Two years is going to replace the the right by uh, the Colonial Life Arena. Two years. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I'm, I'm not sure we got to go to 24 hours uh, because I follow an account on Instagram. It's like OSHA OSHA fails. Yeah. So like, there's some there's some space between 24 hours and and 10 years that we should be striving to hit and. Uh, you know, I, I commend uh, Secretary Hall for a lot of the work that they've done, but more has got to be done. And before I'm ready to just throw hundreds of millions more dollars at this problem, um, I want to ensure that we can implement that in a responsible way. Because if I'm going to pretend like inflation is not a problem, I'd at least like to be able to know that it's going to uh, yield a result that, that improves people's lives. Yeah. 
But well, you know, I feel so left out because I don't go on YouTube and watch bridge construction or bridge repair. So I kind of don't know what y'all are talking about, but I commend you. <laughs> y'all are, hey, you're sleeping like a baby these days. Yeah, right. The rest of us are up worrying. Um, let, let's talk about, in a, in a theoretical conversation here, uh, you know, you look at states that, some some progressive states, though South Carolina's done extremely well. I think we're the fourth most populated since the, or fourth most popular state where people moved during the pandemic. We've seen population growth through the roof, um, which, which is, impacts everybody, the roads, redistricting or whatever. But you look at states that have been progressive with their growth, and especially from an economic development standpoint, they've invested millions or billions in a one particular area. Uh, and, and many have heard me say Boston put a billion dollars into life sciences about 10 years ago. Is there a big project out there that, that could be transformational for South Carolina? I mean, is there a conversation where we don't spend, we got so much money, do we spend some of it on a, a huge investment that makes South Carolina competitive for years to come? Is that a possibility? You know, that, that sounds exciting. And as you talk about it, I'm thinking of whether somebody's mentioned something like that to me over the years and they have not. And so if you or anybody listening comes up with something like that, please don't fail to share it because you're exactly right. I think that's what we have to do. We are so attractive to Northern retirees that it's going to become a problem. And if we don't transform ourselves into a state that simply accepts people that are coming down here because they like the fact that South Carolina is a low tax state, but they don't want to spend any money. They don't want to make anything better. They don't want to improve the lives of anybody because they did just fine up north and they just want to come down here and retire. We have got to do better than that. As you talked about the infrastructure needs, the healthcare needs, all of that is going to start coming to bear and it comes at a cost. And if we can't take South Carolina and move it in a different direction, then we're just failing. You know, one of the things that I've talked about over the years is placing a bigger emphasis on local government getting out of the way. You know, I find that my local government is one of my biggest impediments on a day-to-day -day basis of doing business, whether it's parking, whether it's signs, whether it's them not getting on my the gas station next door, which has litter out the wazoo and they don't say anything about it, whatever that is, I find that local government continues to be my biggest impediment. And we've got to figure out how to take the bureaucrats and the bureaucracy out of local government so that the state can have big ideas and then implementation. But we're wasting our time with big ideas and implementation when these big ideas are met with local government obstacles that don't allow us to do big ideas. Micah, just, just yeah, humor me for ahead. a second before you start. <laughs> Does he not sound like more of a Republican every day? <laughs> It, I don't. I don't. Small I business don't know what owner anymore, Carl. I, you know, we just changed the meaning of all the words. So I think Todd sounds like Todd. Makes a lot of sense. Um, you're welcome to come on the team. We'd love to have you. I don't know what we're for these days, but but that sounds like a good idea. Uh, before you go there, let me say, in in, in all seriousness, last year, Michael, y'all had the most craziest two day session back in December. Uh, it was brought up, there was an anti-mandate mandate bill that came up from the far right. I mean, it was, it was out there, which basically prohibited businesses from mandating a vaccine. In 20 some odd years following state house stuff, I've never seen anything like it. It's crazy. Todd stood up was, sat, I mean, the most articulate, middle of the road, a just pragmatic member. And so I wanted to thank you publicly for that. Uh, you and Caesar McKnight did a fantastic job. Caesar down in Williamsburg County. Uh, so I want to publicly thank you for that. But two, what the heck is going on uh, with with the politics? It seems somewhat uh, it was the 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 tail wagging the dog. Well, I don't think it's limited to just that one issue. I mean, you see the topsy turvy nature of the the political spectrum. You know, flip flopping when you look at uh, you know the political left Democrats. Uh, uh, you know, bemoaning people not incarcerated, uh, complaining that people are not getting long enough prison sentences, um, you know, uh, cheering for prosecutions. It's a crazy, it's a crazy time. I, I don't know how to explain it. I, I think uh, if you could hand me 
the history books that are written about uh, our current time that are written, of course, 200 years from now, I, I think it'll just be utterly fascinating to see how we make our way uh, through this, assuming we do get to the end of it. Um, and I'm not convinced that we necessarily will, given that we've had, what, seven earthquakes, six earthquakes in the last week. I mean, if that is not God reaching down and saying, hey, um, well, or it could just be tectonic shifts. I don't know. But, you know, the point is, the point is, uh, I, I can't explain it. I, I certainly can't explain it. Um, it is definitely an interesting time. All right. I, I didn't let Micah, I don't even remember what the question was now, but uh, I don't remember we'll, either. We'll switch to another topic. How about, all right, we talked about, let's talk redistricting. Is, is the House going to pass a crazy Senate uh, congressional plan uh, maybe the first two weeks? You got to, right? You got to do something quickly. We have to do something quickly because the lawsuits are coming. And so we've got to get a plan out so that the lawsuits can come. Uh, and I have not seen the latest congressional plan. I'm interested to see it and see how people will calm down or even get more excited about it. Uh, and for those people that are not dialed in on this, apparently the first two House plans that were drawn regarding congressional districts uh, simply packed every Black person in South Carolina into Jim Clyburn's district. And I don't know who that made unhappy, except I know it's going to draw lawsuits and probably the only way that our plan would be struck down. So they went back to the drawing board. I'm told that there's another plan out there that maybe does a better job. Uh, but Michael's on judiciary, so maybe he can speak to that a little bit better than I can. Um, I cannot because uh, I'm not on the, the subcommittee. I've had no involvement uh, really in the redistricting plan. Um, but, but I can say that I will have involvement uh, next week because, uh, as Todd says, this is something we're, th this will be our first uh, priority of business is to take care of, of redistricting. You know, we, we're constitutionally obligated to do that. Um, and we've got to do it quickly so that uh, the lawsuits can proceed. Um, I'm hopeful that whatever we do pass uh, will pass judicial scrutiny um but that's something i you know i'm just saying because i'm supposed to <laughs> uh, if anybody had a uh a, the wizard hat and looking into the future does anybody think that we get does does uh filing get pushed back i don't think filing gets pushed back i, I think we're going to have an answer before then and, and in particular if it's congressional filing there's only really a couple of districts that are complaining. And if the house can't fix those, then we just need to go back to the drawing board right away and do it. Uh, Cause that just doesn't make any sense. We've done a house plan. Everybody's pretty good with that, even though I'm sure we'll get sued over it, but it looks like it's a decent house plan. We've done the same thing with the Senate. It's only the congressional plan that is up in the air in this point, at this point. All right, let's talk about redistricting for a minute. And I know Lynn put a, put a question in there about redistricting. The Midlands got screwed out on this one, right? I mean, at some point, uh, the, the coast got picked up because of population. But we, I mean, losing the Senate seat, losing the House seat, what's the impact? Well, when you get elected right before reapportionment, what you don't do is tell people that you're going to retire. Because what you're essentially telling them is that your district is going to be dissolved, which is exactly what happened to Senator Apulian's district. He said he got elected so that he could make sure that that district saved. But he also said he wasn't going to run again, which is, again, the reason why he no longer has a district. Uh, and yes, we lost a house seat because what you had was population growth on the coast. You had population growth in the Greenville area and simply not enough population growth in the Midlands area. Yet when I look at local government, I don't see them doing anything to get the barriers out, out of the way so that we can have growth moving forward. Uh, and it's disturbing as I look at county councils in the area and city government, I just don't think they get it. Yeah, I now live in the city of Columbia, which does not have a soul. There is no entertainment. There's no place to go. Everybody goes to one restaurant. And the, the name is Halls, if anybody's wondering, uh, because that's the only place to go in the city of Columbia. And it's disturbing. Uh, we've got to do a better job. The city's got to do a better job. The county's got to do a better job. I've already talked to our mayor about it, uh, but it's just something we've got to work on because people need a reason to go places. And what we don't have is a reason to come to the Midlands. You know, if you're a business looking to come to South Carolina, are you going to go to Greenville and look at all those restaurants and the nice downtown area and leave there and go to Columbia and go, OK, well, we got one place to go in the city of Columbia. Other than that, we've got a senator that hates the entertainment district for the college kids. And so that's closing down. We've got a college that can't entertain anybody. And so I don't know what they're going to do moving forward. You know, we've got to figure out how to do a better job in the Midlands or we're simply going to die on the vine the way it looks like we, we did before reapportionment. 
there, Micah? Yeah, I think I think it's a function of the fact that you know the Midlands has just not kept pace with the growth of the rest of the state, uh, and specifically, uh, and, and I'm not uh, casting you know too negative of aspersions here, but it's the city of Columbia and Richland County. Uh, you know, Lexington County is growing, West West Columbia, Casey are growing. Uh, and, and the city of Columbia is not. And, and I'll be the first to tell you that Columbia is the big brother here in, in the Midlands region. And, uh, you know, that's a very wide river behind me, uh, literally and, and, and more importantly, uh, as a metaphor, um, because we're not bringing people to the Midlands. We're not bringing people to Columbia for any particular reason. And, and the power of a politician by force of personality to preserve the status quo can only go so far. And I'll leave the you know critiques to the, those approaches uh, to others. But the, the reality is, if you're not attracting industry because you've got terrible growth policies, you've got terrible tax policies, you've got terrible uh, property tax regime uh, for businesses, well, you're not going to have people there. And and insofar as we're going to have a small R Republican government that tries to match uh, population numbers with representation numbers, then you end up losing representation in, in both chambers. Um, and, and it's not a great long-term fix. And I, I point very uh, directly at local government for that, because you can't ask state government to come in uh, and try and fix all your problems, uh, and certainly not the federal government. Um, I, I'm optimistic, though. Uh, obviously, later today, there's a, a significant change in leadership here in the city of Columbia. Um, I hope that... Uh, you know, county council over there uh, takes note of what voters have, have sent the message for and, and ultimately helps deliver a, a uh, framework for uh, the Midlands to grow in some way, shape, or form, maybe something akin to uh, the topic we forgot earlier, which is uh, a, a large, sizable investment of sorts. Now, we're not sitting on MIT, Harvard, and uh, UMass, BC, uh, and that, so I'm not sure what that investment would look like, but I know that we're not suited for it right here in the Midlands right now. Um, uh, hopefully, though, we can continue to do the things that will bring people here. Um, I, I think the convention center expansion is, is a, um, an interesting concept and idea. Certainly, our three rivers uh, in the Midlands are personally, I'm a huge advocate for, and, and I think Todd, for his leadership on helping expand uh, access to that, I think the more we can get people out and enjoying what Columbia has, uh, the better we'll be. Um, but until people put pressure on local government, um, it's, it's be a tough road to hoe. So uh, not to sound repetitive on this, but you mentioned the inauguration today of, uh, of the, the couple members of council and the new mayor. Todd, you said you talked to, to him. What's your one bit of advice you would give Daniel today going forward uh, of what he should tackle first? I think the first thing he's got to look at is creating regulations within the city of Columbia that don't make it a joke when businesses try and come here, when businesses try and grow, when businesses want to expand. It cannot be, and I've called the city of Columbia this over the year, over the years, it can't be the dream killer. It can't be that somebody has an idea and they want to start a restaurant and they go and rent this space and then they go down to the city of Columbia zoning and they are shut down. It can't be that they go to Richland County and they have the same issues. We've got to tackle those issues. We've got to make it so that we are getting in front of people trying to knock down barriers rather than becoming the barrier so that they can't operate. The city manager, Teresa Wilson, does a fantastic job. And every time I've talked to her, she's, she's moved, she's made phone calls. She's tried to do those things that have bumped up against policy. And the policy simply has to change. Now, again, the state has an obligation as well. We have so much untaxed property in downtown Columbia, we have so much untaxed property in Richland County that it is hard for them to get the funding base that they need other than grabbing it out of people's pockets. So the state has to live up to its obligations. And what I've talked about is paying property taxes on those state properties that are in Richland County and in the city of Columbia so that at least for a one year uh, time period, we can get that bump up and collecting that ex extra revenue to not get it directly from taxpayers. But it's not just that, it's not just taxes. It's bureaucracy. It is having a vision that allows people to come to this city and enjoy themselves and want to feel the need to come back. It's why people are moving to Charleston. It's why people are moving to Greenville. And it is exact, it is exactly why people are not moving to the city of Columbia. Yeah, uh, Micah, if you talk to Daniel, what's the first thing you suge would suggest he do? 
I think it's a, it's a question of, of communicating the values that he wants the city of Columbia as, as, an, as an institution to have. Uh, and I talk about in terms of leadership. It's not a resources problem. It's, it's a leadership problem. When you try to interact with the city of Columbia, it is consistently a, uh, a problem of people looking for opportunities to say no. City staff look for ways to say no instead of look for ways to say yes. And they make life more difficult than it needs to be. Uh, they don't try and help you solve and solve your problems and start that business and, and open your shop doors. Um, and I think, again, that's a culture issue. Uh, to the extent it's a policy, then, you know, top to bottom, let's overhaul it and the city of Columbia pass out the new policy uh, or change it by executive fiat, whatever the, the appropriate mechanism is. But, but more than, than that uh, black letter law, the problem as I see it is just a mentality. It's a, it's, it's a lack of responsibility. And I'll give you one quick example from my own uh, experience as, as a practicing attorney. Uh, I have a case over in the city of Columbia and I, and I needed to file a continuance. And so I uh, had a conflict in a different court. And so uh, like most courts in the state, I mailed over the, you know, the request and a forum. And uh, I get an email back that says, uh, actually, you need to do this on our, our website. So, okay, no link, mind you. So I go uh, try to find it. I find the city of Columbia's website. I'm happy to do whatever I'm asked to do. I go to the city of Columbia's uh, municipal court website and uh, the link is broken to continuances. So I email the, the person back and I say, hey, uh, could you send me a link? Because the link I found is broken. And the response I got was, in totality, columbiasc.net or whatever the city's you know, marginal homepage is. Right. So now I'm like, I'm sorry I was unclear, but your link is broken. How would you like me to do what you just told me to do? And, and that isn't such a, a, a moment of boohoo. My God, the lawyer had to do the thing. But it is it is an example of the mentality that is leadership driven. This was not somebody who said, you know what I should do is I should contact someone so we can get this fixed. Let me get IT on the phone and fix this. Moreover, hey, uh, constituent, uh, user of our system, citizen. Here's the information you need right now in the interim. And, and that is the problem that I would say to Mayor Rickman, to the new councilman, uh, look at opportunities of that nature first. Yeah, that's good. good. Good advice, both of you. Thank you for that. I'm gonna skip over and uh, there's a question from Mary Gilliard I wanna ask you, and this goes, this is gonna go back uh, to some, uh, a previous topic, but uh, it's a good question. So. Uh, Mary says, good morning, everyone. My name is Mary, and I'm just about to open up a brick and mortar, uh, Mary's Kitchen. My question about the budget would be, if you were going into a lockdown again, is there money from the state that will help us small businesses stay alive and afloat, or do we need to rely and wait solely on our federal funds? I don't think we're going into a lockdown again, but I think what Mary does have to consider is right now, because of COVID and Omicron, as we've discussed, and as this, is, as this forum in and of itself has moved to this virtual setting, what's going to happen to restaurants moving forward who are looking for that density, who need that density and who now can't get it for fear of making people sick. What is the state going to do to push back on that and make sure that they are successful and people like Mary can start businesses and not feel like this is not the right time because of the pandemic. So we've got to make sure that Mary's okay on the state level, on a local level. I don't think we're going into a lockdown, but I do think we've got to be careful with Omicron and what it's going to do to restaurants that require that density in order to be successful. Okay, great. Um, Mike, anything to add that it be covered? No, I think that's, that's right. I, I would, uh, I've, I have hard pressed to believe we'd be in another lockdown situation, but the, the, the uh, replication of, of Omicron is, uh, if, for no other reason, uh, a worry about workforce. You know, when people, you know, I know the CDC cut their guidelines down in half, but if, twice as many people are getting uh, the COVID and are out of, I mean, you're gonna have those challenges, but I don't know the government can fix that. Yeah. All right, let's switch to another topic altogether. This is one that's near and dear to y'all's heart. It's because uh, y'all are practicing attorneys. But one of the big issues that have popped up uh, in, in for us that we're hearing from our members is the cost of, of, of insurance for companies uh, right now. And that's mainly because of a court case that happened back in 2019 is dealing with joint several, uh, several liability. Um, is that coming up this year? Is that, have y'all been hearing this or is this uh, inside baseball or what, what, what's the, the tort reform temperature these days? 
I have, I have been in on meetings where we've discussed it, but I've also understood that this is another problem being generated by the insurance carriers who realize that if they just raise the premiums for businesses and make it so that they can't operate by paying those premiums, that businesses are going to come to us and demand that there's a change. When in reality, most lawsuits that I've looked at have not changed over the years. Uh, people are still responsible for their own conduct. And that I don't believe that we need another round of tort reform, and especially the joint and several plans that I've seen that would change it. Uh, but again, we're always open. We're always amenable. I just don't believe that insurance companies charging more money has created the crisis uh, that I've seen. What we need to do is figure out how to regulate insurance companies better so that they can't price people out of the market by simply raising prices on people. Okay. Yeah, I, I will say, you know, I've, I've, I've heard talk about it. I think to the extent I've heard talk about it, talk, I talk about talking about it more than we actually talk about it. And uh, I, I would, uh, my sense is that there isn't as much appetite on the House to take this up, certainly not to take it up first. If the Senate uh, decides that it's going to take it up and do something, you know, I, I know that uh, under Chairman Chris Murphy, you know, will evaluate that. I, I, I just, I think it's a, uh, as Todd said, it's, it's insurance companies first, putting pressure on businesses, um, but you know, happy to look at whatever that proposal may look like. I just don't think it's at the top of the agenda, uh, certainly on the house first side of things. Well, especially with a year that's abbreviated. Uh, I mean, I think y'all would, y'all are both cynical enough, uh, like me to rec there's three sessions in one, right? There's before filing purgatory, which is filing. And then, after filing, which you got about a month, right? right? So you got budget redistricting and then getting, I mean, then filing, right? And, and getting elected. So, uh, and then you got the governor's race. Do you, do you all see the governor's race playing a role in the session for y'all? Right now, it's pretty much a snooze fest, but you know, if it picks up at some point, maybe it'll play a role. But right now, I don't, I don't know that anybody's even dialed in to pay attention to it enough. I don't know what they're talking about. Uh, maybe Micah does. No. <laughs> I'll take that as a no. Uh, <laughs> no. I mean, I, I don't. I think at some point, you know, the governor may want to to do something, uh, but but without a primary, um, I don't. I don't see it playing a big big part. All right. What are we missing, Ty? What What do you hope to accomplish in uh, this session for you, or what you're hearing from your constituents? What What's the What's the number one thing for you? Well, I want to get medical marijuana passed. I, I think that we have missed that train. We should have done that a long time ago. And the government telling people, adults that have jobs or educated that it's 50 years old, that they can't smoke marijuana if it makes them feel better is stupid. That we've got a huge veteran population here. We know the impact of medical marijuana on PTSD symptoms, on people wanting to commit suicide. And the fact that we don't allow them to self-medicate to use that when we do allow them to get opioids that are killing us by the thousands is again, stupid. I think we need to look at sports betting, online sports betting. Again, the government needs to get out of people's way. It's something that they have, they have shown they wanna do in other states and they need to be able to do it here. We also need alcohol laws that simply make sense. We don't need to stop serving alcohol at seven o'clock every day of the week, in particular in Myrtle Beach in Charleston where tourists come down, they have no idea that that's the law and then they can't go buy it but yet they can go into a restaurant and drink it right away and get drunk. Again, I don't drink, but things that just don't make sense, we've got to stop doing those things. We can do better, we've got to do better. As we talked about before, we've got retirees coming down in mass, we've got infrastructure issues. We can do things that'll, that'll get a sustainable revenue, move this state forward, and they simply make sense. Gotcha. I, I think that's moving ahead, right? I mean, that that's, it's the Senate's prepared, getting ready to tackle that first? That's what I hear. Uh, that's what Tom Davis says. He, he says it'll be one of the first bills that comes out. Uh, but again, that bill needs some tweaking. We just got to get to the point where, and I've talked to Chief Keel about this because SLED is just so wrong. At what point does government say that somebody can smoke something or take an edible on something that makes them feel better if they are 50 years old, if they're 40 years old? What's the age? It can't be that government knows better than everybody else does at what makes them feel better and doesn't kill them the way that opioids do. Yeah. Michael, back to you. What, uh, what's your number one priority for this um, session? Killing stupid bills. Um, it's really, 
really uh, sort of embraced defensive uh, legislation more than offensive, I guess. Uh, you know, the things I'm interested in uh, probably aren't realistic this term. You know, I think we've got to do something on our state income tax system. I, I think we've got to somehow reconcile what our actual uh, income tax rates are um, with our nominal income tax rates. Uh, I think we're at a competitive disadvantage when North Carolina is actively changing the sticker price. Um, I, I recognize, though, that in order to make those sorts of uh, shifts, that uh, it takes a lot of a lot of coordination. Um, again, in the uh, five years or so that I've been there, um, a lot of things got to be aligned. You know, just a, a couple very ardent uh, legislators is not enough to make that happen. Um, I think there's a lot of work to still to be done to make permanent uh, some of the executive uh, order rescissions and regulations that uh, you know came about as a result of the pandemic when we realized we didn't need quite so many regulations. I think there's some some opportunities there to do that. Um, I'd like us to take a look uh, on a statewide level at our, our energy system. Uh, at our grid in terms of resilience. And, and that's not just code for, hey, let's implement more uh, alternatives or, or renewables, but, but are we well positioned to sustain uh, systemic shocks, whether that's a, a pipeline disruption because uh, some uh, you know, hacker in, in, in Kyrgyzstan decides to hijack the, the oil pipeline or natural gas pipeline, uh, whether we have a natural event disaster, how are we gonna ensure that South Carolinians have the power they need uh, to, to not just live, but to continue to thrive? Um, we, we haven't had a statewide study of that order. Um, we, we just recently did one for, for winter resilience, but I, I think we need to go further than that. Um, and, and I'll just say uh, one of Todd's points uh, that I think makes a lot of sense is uh, online sports gambling. I can understand the reluctance to say, let's not have casinos because nobody wants to see grandma chain smoking cigarettes as she pumps quarters into a slot machine. But if I could sit here on my phone and bet on made up things like cryptocurrency, which are completely made up, absolutely detached from reality, what's fundamentally different than that than me uh, placing a, an online bet uh, on a sports app of some kind? That, that just, somebody's going to have to reconcile those two uh, for me. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just stopping stupid things, hopefully. Um, With I, respect, all due respect. No, I, I just, I'm listening to y'all and just laughing. I think this is great. It, it's actually very informative. I don't, I'm not taking it lightly. I just, uh, it's fun listening. Um, you mentioned, Micah, on the tax stuff. I mean, there's obviously with this much one time money coming in. Is now a time that we look at the tax burden that we have? And obviously, North Carolina is going to kick our panties in the next few years with the structure they have. One, on incentives, they're, they are incentivizing tech companies. At it. And with Apple going in there, Google going in there, I mean, they are doing phenomenal things in North Carolina to attract high-talent jobs. By the way, average pay is $180,000 per job, and they're getting 3000 of them. Uh, what do we need to do specifically on the tax to be a step ahead or not even we're, we're so far behind. How do we catch up or go ahead? Well, I, I think there's, there's more uh, aspects of that than, than meets the eye. I mean, first of all, when you, when you look at North Carolina, you have to recognize some of the earlier decisions that they've made to build a framework for the, that uh, sort of expansion of a tax space to 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 grow and namely they've got a higher education system that is first class uh the the north carolina higher education system uh is leagues above where we are and i think we've got to do better there so that we can uh have the workforce to support that sort of industry expansion not to to say we don't have that here obviously we're doing it uh in in some tech areas and in insurance software for example we could do more there uh, but specifically to your question uh, with regard to taxes, um, I'm not sure that we really want to make fundamental changes in our system. You know, we've got a three-legged stool here of, of revenues between uh, property taxes, sales taxes, and income taxes that we really want to disrupt that in the middle of a, a, a pandemic uh, to which we've not yet seen the end of. Um, 
But that being said, I think there are some opportunities to look at improving our uh, incentive uh, regime. Um, I, I think certainly there's some, some disclosure and sunlight uh, improvement opportunities uh, that I know Todd has, has advocated for in the past. Um, I think we could do better there. Uh, and again, I think we could reconcile our, our uh, marginal income tax rate with our uh, uh, actual um, our nominal income tax rate with our actual income tax rates. Um, but that requires then uh, the the always evil special interests to accept that that maybe we we shouldn't exempt the uh, newspaper bailing twine uh, from uh, sales taxes of sorts uh, or income tax. You've got to kind of you got to fix all that at once. Right. It's the Act 388 problem, but of a different flavor. Which is why Todd is. It, I think in 22 years, are there six tax studies? Is that it? I'm, I'm sure it's more, and I'm sure there's <laughs> other panels and groups that have gotten together and tried yeah. to fix it. But you know, like yeah. I, I, let me be clear. I don't. I don't want to be too loud about this because then you get sent to some ad hoc committee to waste your <laughs> summer coming up with some report that nobody reads. So I, please, nobody. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't going there. I just say that's why it hadn't been done. Uh, there's been all these tax studies that said we need to go and do it. It's tough because right. you, 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 it gets so big. It, it turns out to be the the, the elephant. Uh, right. Anyway, all right. I, I uh, had a, look, if I can just say this, bro, I had a I had a boss one time, a tank manager, who just said, at some point, you got to stop standing around and admiring the problem and going, "Wow, that is a big problem." Oh <laughs> golly, that is a that is such a big problem. At some point, <laughs> you've got to start acting and eating that elephant one bite at a time. Um, and, and maybe the first bite is around our incentive structure, uh, wherever those opportunities are. Uh, I'm not advocating any one particular approach, but but I think uh, in light of the fact that our competitors, and we are competitors with North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, we've got to, to recognize that we're in a time competitive space and start taking action now, or otherwise we're going to wake up one day and, and find out that we're the Southern state where people uh, are immigrating from. I agree with you 100% there. All right, we're closing in on time. I got a couple of comments I want to read out. One, um, William Cook put this in. If you, uh, I'm going to answer a question and read it at the same time. Are we obligated to spend all the federal dollars within a specific time period? William, it all depends on which department, which, what bail of money it is. If it's DOT money, you do have a certain amount of time, but the state has an obligation to submit, um, I think, 20% matching funds. So it all depends on the strings of the agency. <laughs> Um, I think that's right, guys. Um, that's right. Uh, Heather Mitchell, uh, one of our board members, uh, Todd, sent you a, a, a question slash comment. Todd is vice chair of city center partnerships, which promotes the main street district. I'd like to invite you to have a drink on the rooftop of Hendrix, go dancing at the Woody, listen to jazz at the joint, play bin ball at transmission arcade, check out our elegance. It just opened smoke. Uh, or a glass of wine at Lulu Drake, sweet cream, or watch football outdoor at Market on Main. We need you as an advocate for Main Street. Listen, I'm there. I've done all those things and do them on a regular basis. I also go to Soda City almost every Saturday morning to enjoy what Main Street has to offer. But we've got to be bigger than just one block. We've got to be bigger than just one street. Uh, the city of Columbia can do more, and we just simply have to get together pull up our britches and get it done. Great. All right. Um, all right. I, I, I'm, I'm I want to be respectful of y'all's time um, because I know y'all have work to do before, uh, before session starts. Let's wrap up comments. Uh, Micah, la oh. close the comments. we've got s close to 70 people on or so. Uh, what's your thoughts on session overview of, uh, general generalities of what's coming you know I, I think it's we'll we'll spend time on redistricting uh which will be uh a lot of bloviating virtue signaling i think uh the serious people will be working on budget stuff um i, I suspect there'll be a couple issues that don't come to front of mind that we'll take care of um, but being a a uh, election year um i think you'll see kind of a lull uh coming into second half of february early march um 
until filing's done. As you said, Carl, probably three seasons. Um, and most of the work, it's the series work is going to be in the budget stuff. Um, I, I don't see uh, a whole lot of uh, seismic legislation on the House side. And I might be just totally missing something right now. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think most of us who, who follow this stuff are going to watch the Senate and see how the Senate acts and what they do. Um, and if uh, they can produce something useful. Todd. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think all eyes are going to be on the Senate to see how they react and how they get through legislation that's important and what they're going to start doing with their budget process. I don't really see anything right now that's seismic uh, coming out of the House. But again, I could be wrong. We've got a leadership meeting later on today that we'll take a look at uh, the ideas that are coming forward. I just hadn't heard of anything that right now everybody needs to get on board and figure out how we're going to handle it. Okay. Well, let me tell you, on behalf of the Columbia Chamber and our partners in the Midlands business folks around here, uh, we appreciate y'all's leadership. One, uh, really thoughtful thinkers here. And I, I, I'm not, you know, I don't blow a ton of smoke, uh, but I really do appreciate y'all individually, but also how y'all look after us. So thanks for that. And um, let us know how we can help you coming in uh, to the session. If there's something you need from us, don't hesitate to. Uh, to well, Carl, let me, let me interrupt you to take advantage of that because there is something that you and, and all 70 some odd people who are listening can, can do. And that is if you are a normal, sane thinking person, then you should be engaged in the political process. Because if you stay silent, whether that's using your voice, your social media, or your money, if you are not engaged in some meaningful way, then you are ceding good governance to the crazies. And they are on both sides of the political spectrum. And, and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for rational people to, to engage in the system. And, and if you've taken the time to spend your, probably most of them are paid lobbyists and they have to be here or at least get the bill for this. But if you, <laughs> If you care, if you give a damn about a good state, a good country, a good locality, then you need to get engaged in some meaningful way. Spend your money, use your voice, get your friends out, because otherwise we're going to be we're going to be in a world of hurt in the not too distant future. Thank hey, you. I, hey, thank you for that. In, in closing, I just I'm sorry, I'm just seeing a comment from Ron Harvey. Let's look at. Uh, military pay and and making all that tax exempt at some point Todd, where well, your ways and means uh, i know leatherman had been fighting that for a long time but if we can get the one of the reasons we're seeing so many military veterans leave our state is because 34 states totally uh have exempted their military pay from state taxes so we'll we can bring that up yeah, we've, we've looked at that in the past, and I don't know where that is, but I'll certainly take a look at that moving forward. But right. I, I want to join Micah very quickly and just tell people he is exactly right. The crazies are going to take over, and you're going to look up, and there's going to be nobody left at that state house that understands normal or that is normal. It's going to happen on the local government level as well. And so if you are engaged in politics, if you just mildly pay attention to it, you've got to put your money where your mouth is because I'm telling you, we are headed for a reckoning, and it is not going to be good. Unfortunately, I agree with both of you, and uh, but at least we have two sane ones up there still from the hey. Midlands. <laughs> Arguably, right? <laughs> we weren't sure you were talking about us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listen, uh, I appreciate both of y'all very much. I hope uh, we wish you well uh, this session, but thanks for your service to our state, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity.